Hello, everyone, again. I hope you can hear me. Um, let me start with a very small uh, comment on interpretation in three languages. Uh, did that in English, French, and Spanish. Um, I'll start with uh, French. Uh, bonjour à tous et à toutes. Merci d'être avec nous aujourd'hui. Euh, si vous souhaitez euh, suivre cette conversation en français, on va vous demander de bien vouloir euh, cliquer sur l'icône euh, comme un globe qui apparaît sur votre, votre écran. Ça doit être dans le menu en bas de, de votre Zoom et choisir le canal en français. Comme ça, toutes les interventions vous arriveront en français. Merci d'avance. Euh, je vais euh, faire la même annonce en, en anglais et en espagnol. Euh, Hola a todos y todas, muchísimas gracias por estar con nosotros hoy. Eh, tenemos interpretación simultánea en tres lenguas. En esta reunión, para elegir la, el español, hay que clicar, eh, hacer clic en, la, en el icono de un globo, como este que está en su pantalla, eh, en la parte eh, derecha de abajo del menú que aparece en su Zoom, elegir el, eh, el canal de español. Um, Okay, back to English. Um, if you're on the main floor, um, I would also encourage you to choose, uh, click on the interpretation button and then choose English because we will have intervention in, in other languages. This way you'll be sure to always hear um, English uh, input coming your way. So I'll give you just a time uh, to do that. Um, and let's just um, go ahead with the start. Um, I'm going to ask everyone that uh, uh, take the floor to speak slowly and to articulate for the benefits of our interpreters. And with the end of this, uh, of this uh, announcement, let me jump right into the session um, and welcome you to uh, the session on exploring new funding approaches for civil society. Uh, the session is part of the FORA's uh, virtual forum, which are those uh, online encounters we've been doing. This is our third day. Um, FORA's is an international network. Our members are also natural networks at uh, the national and regional level and uh, regional level. Um, but I do know that we have uh, other people with us that uh, they're not forest members, so welcome to you as well. Um, my name is Joyce Soares, I'm the Capacity Development and Membership Coordinator in Forest. Uh, so today we will be, we will have a conversation on um, funding approaches for civil society, uh, and this will be also the opportunity for us to launch the toolkit we've been um, uh, developing uh, that has this, this uh, the same title, just like what all other tools that uh, Forest develops, it was um, based on members' expertise. So it was based with a lot of consultation and interviews uh, with members. So thanks uh, to all of you that have contributed to this tool. Uh, it really came from uh, a desire to learn more from peers in this subject. Uh, which was a, a demand within the network. Um, I am going to ask colleagues to share in the chat the link to download the toolkit that is already available, uh, like um, all other tools in English, French, and Spanish. Um, you will have the link on, on the chat and can we move the um, slide, please? Yes. So that's that's the tool that we've, um, we've developed in the in the three languages. Uh, you see, it's a practical resources uh, for organizations. It's not necessarily a list uh, of tips. It's um, a structure for each network to go through it, uh, work through it, apply its own analysis to it, um, its own contextualization. And, um, and really adapt the ideas and make it uh, your own. Uh, this tool was, was written and, and developed before uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, but we will add this aspect to this conversation today as well. 
Um, in addition, we made a small video, uh, a very brief video of five minutes with our members that contributed uh, to the toolkit that we will also share um, with you uh, in the chat in the three languages. It's again available already in YouTube. Um, if we can change the slide, it looks a bit like what you're going to see. So we've had um, 22 organizations being interviewed for this tool, uh, but in the video you will see uh, colleagues from uh, Forest, uh, Spong, uh, Interaction and Bond, uh, sharing their experiences and, um, and a bit of what they shared within the toolkit. For uh, the meeting today, we will, we will count with the presence of uh, Flamingo for NGOs, uh, represented by uh, Rachel Haynes, that uh, you've already seen uh, in your screen. So Flamingo for NGOs is a small consultancy based in the UK. Uh, Rachel Haynes is the head of the, of the consultancy, and they're focused on funding for civil society. So this report was put together by a team of Victoria Ireland, Jamie Duke, and Rachel. Uh, Victoria, she's also with us today. Uh, so the three are independent consultants who all specialize in funding and together have many years of experience of working with diverse NGOs, CSOs, platforms, and networks. Um, we will also have a panel composed by forest members. Uh, thanks to all of you. Thanks to Sarun uh, Soing from Cambodia, Liliana Rodriguez from Colombia, Akmal Ali uh, representing the Pacific Regional uh, Network, um, Mr. Uh, Monametsky Sokowi from Botswana, and Zoe Abram Hansen from the UK. Um, after the, a very brief presentation right now, um, with the, with the main findings, uh, we will engage in a conversation with you actually, and we will ask you from inputs at several moments of, of this conversation. Um, and at any point, if you have comments or questions, please, please feel free to use the chat box for that. Uh, and that's the end of my introduction. I'm going to give then the floor to Rachel and then Victoria who will give us a very brief uh, introduction with the main findings of, of the tool. Thank you and over to you, Rita. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Joyce. Um, so the toolkit that we're presenting today was uh, developed from the findings of a research report that the Flamingo team wrote in for Forest, wrote in 2019, relating to the funding of networks and platforms. Through the research, we looked at both the current situation for funding, as well as new and emerging approaches that hold some promise for the future. Some of the key findings that came out of that research has, have helped to inform and shape the toolkit. And I'm just going to introduce by sharing some of the main headlines. So firstly, the, there was a surprising lack of diversity in the funding sources for the majority of the platforms and networks that we spoke to, with many relying largely or exclusively on EU funding. And that was particularly true for smaller national CSO platforms from the global south. Another important source of income for forest members was members' fees and it was a particularly significant source for a smaller number. However, that very much varied depending on the local context and the local political and funding environment. An area of growing interest was generating income through selling services, and that include, included things such as um, renting out rooms, car rental, product sales, and consultancies, for example, in research or training. And we found that there are trends in the current funding environment that are getting in the way of um, network and platforms being able to plan ahead for sustainability, as well as to innovate and be independent. These include increasingly bureaucratic approaches to restricted funding with heavy administrative requirements and also the shrinking of space for civil society. 
In terms of what works, our research shows that trust building and collaborative working between network platforms and their donors are really important for responding to those challenges. And it's been interesting to see how in the times of COVID this year, during the pandemic, these strong relationships have really paid off. And finally, some of the, the best and most interesting practices that we found aim to shift power structures, uh, placing decision making around funding in the hands of communities and beneficiaries. And some examples of that are participatory grant making, community foundations and co-creation. So I'm just going to hand over to Victoria now, who's going to talk through some of the recommendations that came from the interviews. Thanks, Rachel. Um, yes, yeah, so when we, um, we've had those initial findings and then we did a series of interviews with about 20 um, of you, some of you are on the call today, I know. So um, it's really great to, to see, well, see some of you again and hopefully hear from you during the session. Um, so the, when we added together the findings from the interviews and the desk research that Rachel's just talked through, um, we came up with six recommendations, which really, they shone through very strongly from, from everything that, that we'd read and that we'd spoken to you all about. So the first one was the importance of knowing your value and being able to articulate it clearly. So whoever you're seeking funding from, whether it's a big trust or foundation, an institutional donor or um, a major donor philanthropist, then you need to be able to explain really clearly to them what value you offer and why your organisation is the best organisation to deliver that piece of work. Um, so it's very important to have evidence of that impact, whether it's through quotes, stories, or sometimes it will be through data and statistics. Um, secondly, was to understand the value of your memberships. Obviously for, for networks and platforms, your membership is really the heart of your organization. Um, they are the experts in your sector. They know what support they want from you. And for some, some of you, their membership fees are a very important and unrestricted part of your income. And so continuing to meet their needs, especially during difficult times, whether that's a recession um, or you know, any, well, obviously COVID we're talking about now, but I know there's that economic downturn that is part of that story. Um, you want them to be saying, well, that's something we can't, we mustn't cut that from our budget. It's essential to, to us. Um, so so that, that, that was one thing. And also knowing what they need, keeping up to date with them. Thirdly, we noted how important it is to cultivate your donor relationships, um, your existing donors. So a lot of people spoke about the need to find new financing, new income sources, which, which is very important, that diversification. But there's a danger of focusing on that and neglecting some of your existing donors. And that was something that came through strongly, needing to get the balance right to deepen your existing relationships. Um, and yeah, just keeping in touch. Sometimes I think there's a saying, isn't there, that you know, your strongest, your best donor is the current donor, um, something like that. Number four, was avoiding single donor dependency. Um, there was quite a high level of organizations who were, had more than 80% of income from one donor. Often that was the EU, but other sometimes it was others. Um, obviously it's very, very risky. If that donor changes priorities, you can be really left high and dry. Um, so having, having a, you know, another sort of big donor, at least one is, is important. Um, and that was really what our fifth suggestion was all about, diversifying, branching out. Um, it can be time consuming, but really important for, for long term sustainability. So final recommendation was really more of a challenge um, to turn your threats into opportunities um, and really ask, you know, how, whatever difficult situation you're in, ask that question, what does this make possible? Um, an example that stood out to us was the shrinking of civic space, which was a particular focus of this research. Um, 
and and it's it's a big threat to many of you and to your members but some people also said well the good thing is that some donors are really prioritizing work around space and so that can be an opportunity for us to stand out um, to and to move into that space to attract that funding the point was made, I think, about networks and members that they are slightly more anonymous or they can gather the voice of their members, allowing them to be more anonymous, but also to have a voice in, in the world through the network. So that that was really felt to be something which was important to, yeah, to turn it into the, you know, take the opportunity. Um, and as, as Joyce said, the research was completed um, last year, so before, before COVID. I think all of these recommendations are as valid as ever. Um, I think particularly the one about knowing your value and making sure that the way you articulate that is, is relevant to the situation that your members are operating in today. Um, valuing those members and really consulting with them to again to just keep up to date what do they most need now um, and then donor relationships again speaking to them and and being on board ready for new initiatives that they might want to fund in the new environment uh, making sure they know the direction you're moving so that you might be the first people they think about when they have a new program um, so I think those three are are really key and, and particularly stand out in the current environment. Thanks so much, um, Victoria and Rachel. Um, before moving us on to the next part of our session, uh, perhaps um, I would like to give you some minutes just to tell us how you approach the work um, methodolog methodologically. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Joy. So um, we, the, the research uh, began with a desk review to understand current trends and also to see what sort of work had already been done in this area and um, just do, do a complete literature review to see whether or not there were already materials that might answer some of the questions that we were seeking to answer. Um, and interestingly we found that there was you know a lot of literature that would be coming from donors but not so much from civil society itself in particular and in particular not from civil society in the global south however um we we undertook the literature research and that helped us to understand the key areas that we needed to explore in more depth um, and then we did extra primary research using 20 interviews with networks and platforms around the globe um, and from all regions, being careful to make sure that we were balancing larger and smaller networks, um, young, young networks and long established ones. And that's where we really got the, the wealth of um, <clears throat> the data that we've used in the toolkit and in terms of it examples of approaches that are being used. So we analysed the desk research and the interview together and we were then able to identify the six, six themes that Victoria has introduced um, and these stood out very strongly from all of our research. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Rachel. Um, so the next part of our um, of our session, it will be, uh, it will have quite a participatory approach. So how is that, how is that going to work? We're going to put a survey on the screen. Uh, we're going to, that will ask you a question about your organization. Uh, we will ask you to vote uh, to the best of your knowledge, to, it can be approximately. Uh, the idea is really to take the temperature and, and to see uh, how, um, how colleagues are, for example, the one that just appeared. Um, the idea is just to, to take the temperature. Um, once everyone votes, the results will appear on the screen. And then afterwards, we will show them, of course, the results to all of you. Uh, be prepared to vote. We will only leave the survey for, um, for one minute each. And then we will ask uh, Victoria and Rachel to comment as well as our 
a group of five panelists uh, that I will invite to raise their hands when they want to jump in and comment uh, on a subject so that I, can, I know and, and, and can give you the floor. Um, okay. So the first question, um, we were mentioning earlier the importance of being able to clearly articulate value and um, having a clear theory of change can be a good first step. And that's the link with the first uh, question that appeared on your screen. So the question is, uh, do you have an organizational theory of change? And then you have uh, three options. I can't see the, yes, okay, I have it. So do you have an organizational theory of change? The first uh, possibility for answer is yes. The second one is under development. And the third one is no. So a few of you have already voted. Uh, we will end that very soon. Still 15 seconds maybe for those of you who haven't. So do you have an organizational theory of change? Yes, under development or no? I think we can show the results. Arturo, please. Okay. Can you all see the results? Great. So Victoria, over to you. Great, thanks Joyce. And thank you to everyone for voting. Um, it really does help us. I think about two thirds of you voted on the call um, and I just really encourage you to jump in. Um, as Joyce said, it is completely confidential. We can't see who's voting and who's not um, and we can't see what your vote is, but it really makes it a lot richer. I think the conversation if you if you are able to share. Um, so, yeah, so the results, it's great to see that half of you over half of you have got um, an organizational theory of change and another quarter have got it under development. Um, so for anyone who's not familiar with the terminology, the term um, theory of change, it is, um, I actually looked up this official definition this morning, it is a way of demonstrating why a particular way of working is so effective. Um, so it shows your pathway to change um, it also makes explicit what you know about how change happens in both the short, medium and long term in order to achieve your intended impact. So it shows a route essentially from the situation that you're currently operating in to the situation that you want to bring about with your work and then the individual steps that you need to take to get there. Um, so some of them will be short activities, maybe training or capacity building. Perhaps other things require a big policy change and obviously they will take longer. And then your theory of change is a way of explaining all of those things and, and how they work and what you know about how they work. So from your previous experience, what works well, how long does it take? And a theory of change is really a way to present that on a single page. Um, lots of organisations use diagrams, um, some will just have a very simple narrative theory of a change, um, it's really up to you. There is actually a website, um, I think it is just called theoryofchange.com, I'm not sure, but if you look it up it comes up very easily. And on that website they have lots of tools that you can use, but they also have lots of examples, so it's a great way to just get, 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 um, get a flavour for them. Um, so yeah, theory of change is a great way to just think through why your organization exists, what your purpose is and how you fulfill it. Um, you can share it with your donors. It really helps you to communicate your value to them. Um, and obviously share it with your membership to see if it resonates with them. And it can help you within your organization as well to really refine what activities are most important to your goal. Um, how your work connects with the work that other organizations are doing. So it can also be a good way to help you improve your efficiency and effectiveness. Um, I don't know, um, I think we're going on to another poll now, but it would be great to hear in the chat box if people have got really positive experiences or might share just a short, a short uh, sentence about how having a theory of change has helped them and perhaps that will encourage um, more of you, some of the no's to think about perhaps adding that to their plan for, for next year to develop one. Thanks, Joyce. 
Thank you. I think we've had uh, colleagues from the panel that wanted to jump in. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Zoe, Aknal, do you want to jump in? Hi. Uh, <coughs> yes, uh, sure. Uh, so for Piengo, we did uh, we did develop one a theory of change this year. And uh, it was quite an exciting, um, so we had never, uh, in my personal experience, um, uh, sorry, can you hear me, Joyce? Okay, good. So, um, uh, uh, this uh, Pianglo is an organization that works to now that is very, that is trying to really work to bring the humanitarian sector and the development sector together with the bridge, which is sustainable development goals. So, so Piengo, it has become, so if we look at this report, the toolkit, uh, in terms of finding innovative solutions, Piengo is actually on the path to becoming a hub of hubs for humanitarian actors in the Pacific region. So this started a partnership that Piango has had with Start Network, which is a humanitarian based international organizations of 53 organizations based in the UK and developed its own theory of change. It's one page, our steps, our vision, our major goals of how we could achieve. And, 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 and it, become, it makes life really um, simple to be able to see where you want to go. And, 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 and the best thing about it, it's not set in stone. You could actually change as you go to be able to achieve because sometimes some things could work and it doesn't work. So the best thing is if you develop one for yourself, it, uh, I consider a theory of change or, you know, a, a page as a living document. And, and that could actually easily be changed, of course, with consensus and transparency and accountability, but, um, but it's not set in stone. And, and it, it is something that truly helps in, in organizations being able to achieve its ultimate goal or ultimate aim. Thank you so much, Akman, for this. Um, I see Liliana, you have your hand raised. Uh, Liliana is going to take the floor in Spanish. Liliana, eh, ya estás hablando, no te escuchamos. Veo que sacaste tu micrófono. No está en ese mudo, pero no te escuchamos. A ver. Todavía no. Eh, eh, vamos a ver con, con la parte técnica, Liliana, por tu micrófono y te damos la palabra después. Eh, Okay, it's a shame. We can come back to we can come back to Liliana's comment uh, just a second later. Um, we're going to check that. Okay, so that's that's pretty much the idea. We're going to put another survey uh, on your screen. You're going to answer. We're going to have a few comments from Rachel or Victoria, and then we'll ask our panelists to jump in as well. And we ask you to add your comments or questions in the chat. Um, meanwhile, when we see, uh, while we check Liliana's mic, let's uh, launch the second survey then. So the second one is, um, do you run regular member surveys as part of your monitoring and evaluation? First question, first answer is yes. Second is yes, but not regularly. And then the third one is no. Again, this are anonymous, uh, uh, answers, please feel free to answer and to the best of your knowledge. See, we have already more than 10 responses. Um, 
let's give a couple of seconds more. People are still voting. If are you able, is everyone able to see the question on the screen? Uh, if not, please just leave us a message on the chat. Um, okay, I think we can um, show the results, please, uh, Arturo. Okay, great. Reito, over to you. Great, thanks. Yeah, so um, it's really interesting there uh, to see that that uh, over half of people that have responded here said that they do run member surveys um, as part of that ME. And, um, and that's that's really good. I mean, surveys are a, a fantastic way to evidence your impact. Um, and as well as having the data and understanding, getting closer to the, the needs of your membership, you can also gather quotes, which can provide some com compelling anecdotal and evidence as well. So it brings a more human angle to your work, which is really quite hard to demonstrate as a network. Um, this is an issue that came up often in our research that networks are far removed from the work on the ground. Um, and quotes from people can help reduce that distance, especially where your members talk about how your work has improved the service to their beneficiaries, for example, through training, such as to increase inclusion or sustainability. And we also had a very interesting perspective from the network Vanny, who um, talked about how uh, it was important to, to work with donors to, to help them to understand the role of networks in terms of advo advocacy or leading on a particular sector. So leading change, leading transformational change on a sector. And if donors can see themselves as having such a, a, a heavy influence, that this can be a really powerful way of getting their support. Thank you so much, uh, Rachel. Let's check our panelists to see if there is any who wants to comment on this. We have uh, Zoe, the floor is yours. Um, thanks, uh, Rachel and Joyce. Um, one of the things that we've at Bond have found useful in terms of the surveys is first of all, they're um, helping, we do surveys to help us with our advocacy work when we go to kind of different donors to talk about what the situation is like for um, for our members. But actually in terms of our funding, a recent survey that we did was helpful on two fronts. So as, as like a lot of you, um, we get a large part of our, our income from membership fees. And we've been quite worried about what the impact COVID-19 and the finances are of our members, which if our members um, end up um, in kind of quite difficult financial situation, it means they're not going to be able to pay their membership fees, which will then impact us as well. So we had run a survey that was looking at what the what what it what the what the COVID nineteen has meant for members to go to try and get money for our members, but inadvertently we were then able to use that data to understand what um, what our what bonds finances will be like in a couple of years time because we could say to our members, do you think your finance, what, what your finance is going to be like in a year, two years, et cetera. And then from that, we can see what it's going to mean for us. Now it doesn't read, it's not been particularly positive, but it means that we can be prepared for what the future is going to be like in terms of our own finances. Thanks so much, um, Zoe. Sarun, over to you. All right, thank, thank you so much uh, for, for the cooperation com for community work. And, and how our performance is look like uh, to meet their uh, expectation or not. And we also ask for area for improvement annually 
But similarly to our previous speaker as well on the specific issues, for example, on the enabling environment, on particular on the legal frameworks or the uh, implementation of government to civil society, we also conduct a way with members. And so to what extent that we can have a common position together and to what strategy that we can work together for advocating on better enabling environment. And for COVID-19, we also conduct survey. We are looking at several aspects. The two aspects we very focus on uh, as, as an example. First is how we can look at uh, to support the own organization as a member and also as the CCC itself for the institutional rearrangement, as well as for reprogramming in order to respond the, the impacts of COVID-19 and this and that. So uh, all in all is a survey to understand member needs and as well as the feedback from member is very helping us as a membership based organization to move forward. So I uh, highly appreciate in that way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's try to hear uh, Liliana again now. Liliana, over to you. Or if you want to comment on either of these two questions. Um, we still can't hear you, unfortunately. I'm going to change into Spanish. Um, Liliana, todavía no, no te escuchamos, perdón. Eh, vemos que estás conectada sin, y no tienes una cámara. Eh, tal, no sé si estás en la computadora o no, pero seguramente los colegas eh, de foros están contigo hablando sobre, sobre la parte técnica. Eh, Me disculpas por eso. Um, so we're going to continue to check with, uh, with Liliana. Sorry for this. Um, any additional comment from uh, Victoria or Rachel? Should we move on to the next question? I think we could move on. It was really interesting to hear from Sarah and Zoe and, and it was really interesting, I think, what Zoe shared about the kind of unintended discoveries. Um, so I think we often make those as well. So which is which is always useful to notice. Um, but yeah, no, let's let's move on. Great. Then um, the next question is, uh, please. Th thank you. Um, the ne next question is, to the best of your knowledge, what percentage of your network income comes from your main donor? It doesn't need to be a, a completely precise um, percentage, but just an, an overview, an idea. Um, it would be great to to hear from you. I'll probably leave the floor open for a while. That's quite uh, interesting, the responses we're having. Quite in the extremes. <laughs> um, we still have so the question again for the translation, the question is to the best of your knowledge. What percentage of your network income comes from your main donor? That's the question. And we will close in about 10 seconds and show the results. Okay, I think we can show the results. Victory. Great. Thank you, Joyce, and thank you again for, for voting. So it's really interesting to see. Um, so still the, the highest number, which sort of ties in probably with what we would have expected from the research is, um, you know, there's a significant number of you, about just over a third, where your, um, where 80% or more of your income is coming from one single donor, um, which is, 
is obviously the the item that we flagged as as a bit of a risk um and but it's also really great to see there's 27 percent. so again just under a third this time where it's you know dropping down to 60 percent, and i think that's quite encouraging especially it would be really interesting to see maybe especially some of those people in the 60 percent whether they might have said uh, given a different answer a year or two ago um, in which case you know that's really great progress um, and I think that's an important point to make it's it's easy for us as consultants to say oh you mustn't you know you mustn't have 80 percent from one person and you know that's a big risk but that's it you know it's not easy to change from that situation and I think you know my key message would be you know, just try and drop that down gradually. You know, if next year it's seventy percent and the year after it's sixty percent, that's that's great progress and and a really you know good good move forward. Um, so that sixty percent is great. I think you know ideally like fifty percent would be really nice to see. I guess dropping you wouldn't probably want to drop below a third because that's the whole point of having a, a big solid main donor that you can rely on that helps you program into the future um and the, and the third is probably you know a nice healthy space i think for your main donor um and up to 50 percent is is probably quite it's quite common i think um and interestingly i think probably a health warning around the diversification is making sure you give a bit of thought to what the return on investment is on different different types of diversity diversification um and so often people will say oh institutional donors they're such they're such hard work you know it's really hard to get to write a big proposal and secure funding it takes a long time and then the reporting demands are very heavy however they can often give very large grants so it could be that that's a good a good route and it's really balancing up both the effort on the one hand and obviously the reward um, and it's making sure that they're they're in line with each other um, certainly i know with some of the big trusts that can be almost as hard work as institutional but can be very supportive and you can really build a great sort of real working relationship um, I know in, in one of the organisations that I work for during COVID, it was the most flexible donors we had were those big trusts and foundations who were very happy for not only were they not putting too much pressure on us to deliver the things that we had agreed to deliver, but they were also very quick to say, you know, if you want this money for something different, um, you know, you're the expert you know whatever you think is needed we're happy with that um so they can they can be great donors and you know quite demanding in the relationship but very supportive and very flexible um so i think that's that's probably all i'd really say i don't know if rachel has anything to add um or if not back well back to the over to the panelists i think it'd be good to hear from some of them um, especially i don't know if there's any panelists who might themselves have i know a lot of the people that i interviewed were on they had embarked on this journey to increase diversification in diversity sorry <laughs> um, and it would be great to hear from any updates on that that would be really interesting if if there's people on the panel who'd like to share more about that um, but i'll i'll stop for rachel now No, I've, I've got nothing to add. So I think it'd be great to, to pass over to the panelists. Okay, I'll pass um, over to Zoe. And then we also have some comments arriving in written, if you can check that. But Zoe, right now is over to you. Oh, thank you, Joyce. Um, I think when you, so I was interviewed um, as part of this research and I'm sure that we were at that point, I was saying, yes, we want to try and um, reduce our reliance on our largest donor who at that point was um, the Depart the UK Department for International Development. We're, so we're part way through um, a four year, very large grant with them. That, and they've pretty much been supporting us from, I don't know, for the, before I joined Bond, they've always been one of our largest donors. 
but we know that they're unlikely to support us again. And now we're this two way, two years in, and we're only just, despite it being part of my job to try and help our members diversify their funding, we're only just getting to the point where I've managed to get kind of where we're starting to have conversations about looking about how we could get more of funding, but it will have to be from somewhere else. And I think the problem is because it's been a four year grant and it's always been even though we said at the beginning, we need to think about this, it's all it's always pretty much been, oh, well, this is a four year grant. Um, let's wait, let's wait. But now the problem is it's coming to the other side. It's now we're now we're now over that that half that halfway point. Um, and it's it's yeah it's definitely difficult because we always come back to that same point that we're a really hard organization to fundraise for um and people want to support our members but they don't really want to support us um and we just get we kind of get caught in that in that blip and i don't i don't have a another answer to say that to, i can't tell you that we found another major donor even though i wish we could <laughs> thank you zoe um for the panelists uh for those of you who want to put your screen please feel free your camera on please feel free to do that uh Akbar, over to you uh thank you very much Joyce. In, in fact you know diversity of funding has been a focus of the ingo as well and, and, and very importantly, I think if, even before we go there, we must know the value of our membership, which is the, the role we play and, and the uniqueness that we hold. And, and that actually, whether we'll, uh, sometimes some of us don't like this term, but it makes us marketable. It makes us, uh, I mean, while we say that we need donors, hey, the fact of the matter is, the donors also need us to do their job. So as much as we need them, they need us too. We must never forget that as civil society organizations. Therefore, we must not never try to um, compromise on our standards. So um, in terms of diversity of funding, this year we've had a new partner, which is called, uh, which is with UNICEF. And, and Piango has actually become a sub-grant holder, which is, it's, it's a, it's, it's 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 working with the uh, sorry it's working with UNDP on 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 uh, uh, public fi uh, uh, finance management in the Pacific where ten of Piango's national members in ten countries are given sub grants through Piango um, and 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 we are managing that very well so. Uh, uh, you know, we have gone through the UN uh, due diligence process. Uh, we have made sure that uh, Piango has uh, had received a ECOSOC accreditation, which has also helped and contributed to make our case stronger. But but the but the the in order to diversify funding, if I have to say one thing, as a civil society organization, we must always stay relevant. And in order to be relevant, we must become innovative. We must look at new approaches, new ways of thinking. We must be able to uh, turn in uh, the, the, the paradigm shift. That is when we will be able to, but it does not mean that we compromise on our values. The day we compromise on our values, I mean, you know, there are, the fact of the matter is there are certain civil society organizations. I mean, initially they were funded for a particular purpose. The next thing you know, climate change came in, in the Pacific, it's a huge thing. And they've started talking about climate change. And then suddenly COVID-19 came and they all started talking about COVID-19 and they've forgotten why they were founded anyway. And, and this was actually something that was raised in a um, uh, National Civil Society Forum last week, Wednesday, when, uh, which I personally attended with grassroots level civil society organizations. NGOs, community-based organizations, uh, which is about four, four hours drive from where Suva is. And, and I was very privileged to be there with the local organizations and hearing them out. So it is to be relevant. It is to be able to tell the donors, look, while why we need you, you need us as much as we need you. And, and in order to diversify funding, the other one of the crucial parties um, that the donors must also realize that 
the, especially in the global south and and i will and i will uh, finish my intervention after this but there is a colonialist mentality by most of our development partners that in the global south for the uh, even 50 years after for example for fiji after our independence pacific islanders people like us we still continuously need capacity strengthening or they call it building but but maybe we need to identify and redefine what capacity is we need to be we need to be stop there has to be an immediate stop in the defining of what capacity is because in the pacific for example if you go to one of piango's member which is Niue, Niue is a small island state with a population of 1200 people if you try to bring in a european union standard transparency and accountability mechanism in new way and try to do civil society work you will never be able to do it because guess what it's a very small island country you can go around the whole island in 40 minutes everybody knows everybody so how can you implement something so there has to be uh, geopolitical definitions it has to be customized it has to become relevant it, it has to uh, it has to be relevant to the area in which it is. And I'm not saying that there is no chance of corruption or, or, or abuse. There is definitely. But, but mechanisms can be developed from within the community, within the, the, the geographical area where these has to, the projects take place. So um, that is what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Akmal. Um, I see no other hands raised. I will try once more to give the floor to Liliana. Um, Liliana, la intentamos otra vez. Hola, escuchan? Me escuchas? Sí. Ah, bueno, por fin. <laughs> bueno, eh, tengo como varios comentarios. Voy a tratar de mencionar dos para luego seguir aportando. Yo quería frente a lo primero de la teoría del cambio que mencionaron relacionarlo mucho con lo que mencionó Victoria y es la importancia de conocer el valor. Yo considero que allí no solo es importante conocer, sino valorar el conocimiento y los saberes que tienen las organizaciones y las plataformas. Yo creo que nos centramos mucho a veces en lograr la sostenibilidad financiera de las organizaciones y de las plataformas, en ocasiones dejando de lado esa sostenibilidad técnica, la sostenibilidad del conocimiento, que es lo que nos da realmente la sostenibilidad, es ese conocimiento y el saber hacer. Entonces yo creo que cuando hablamos de, de diversificación eh, de fuentes y, y, de, y sobre todo de fuentes es muy importante que esa diversificación siempre responda a ese saber hacer, a lo que nosotros llamamos la oferta de valor de las organizaciones y de las plataformas. Esto es fundamental como para no desvirtuar lo que son y hacen las organizaciones. Digamos que hay que romper una serie de imaginarios y de formas de relacionarnos con otros actores que nos ha hecho mucho daño como en los los últimos años, décadas, y es que nos han asignado un rol de ejecutor, de ejecutor o de operador de recursos, y tenemos que evitar eso, porque allí es cuando eh, perdemos la razón de ser y dejamos de lado y descuidamos nuestra, nuestra oferta de valor, y hay una tendencia muy también de que las organizaciones generemos sostenibilidad económica o financiera, eh, adoptando eh, iniciativas productivas y esto también lo tenemos que revisar, ¿no? Porque si estamos hablando de eh, derechos, sobre todo todo lo que tiene que ver con espacio cívico, derechos de participación, de hacer control social y demás, no podemos descuidar ese rol político que tenemos solo por buscar una sostenibilidad financiera muy orientada a convertirnos o asimilarnos a lo que hace el sector empresarial. Y me quedo ahí con esas reflexiones para luego poder aportar. Gracias. Thank you so much, uh, Liliana. And that makes a perfect uh, segue, actually, to, um, to our next question. 
who is about income generating activities um, that we've heard uh, a lot of uh, our members were uh, undertaking. So the question is, does your organization have any income generating activities? First uh, answer is yes. Second is we are trying to develop them. And the third one is no. I'll give you still a moment to, to vote. Ask in the meanwhile for the panelists that, that wants to comment this to raise their hand. And we still, this is our fourth question. We still have four more. So let's try to be um, brief in our presentation so that we can have time for, for all of them. Um, Victoria, uh, let, it, let me see the survey up. Um, yeah, it's already on for one minute. Let me give you 10 seconds more to vote. And we can show the results that are quite balanced, it seems. Yeah, it's a very equal spread. Well, yeah, there is a very equal spread. So pretty much um, a third in each category. Um, so that's that's yeah, interesting. Just a very a very mixed mixed picture. Um, it's really interesting in the interviews to hear about the different income generating activities from the different platforms. Um, there's a big range. Some are very different from their work. Um, maybe selling products from some of their members, something like that. Um, others were very connected to their work. So um, I think Saran in Cambodia, they have some office space, which they were, I think they were still just looking to make it available um, for CSOs to hire. Um, others were offering paid for training. Um, I know that's, that's a big part of Bond's um, income generating program as well. So, and I think, you know, that really is interesting added value if you can, if you can offer an income generating activity that's actually providing a service. Um, obviously there's challenges if it's a service for your members, then it's kind of extra budget for them to find. Um, and I know there was, there was also talk, I think around if you were providing a service that was very different from your kind of charitable aims, then there can be conflict of interest sometimes about where you're putting your efforts. Um, so yeah, interesting to see. And I did just want to dip in. It was great um, hearing the reflections from Fiji about the, the islands and the really specific local um, sort of context. It's really, really relevant and great to hear. And I wanted to share something actually that not, some of you may have heard of this, but there was, I joined a workshop a couple of weeks ago. It's called, it was called the global, I looked it up actually to make sure I get it right. The good, a uh, good financial grants practice. Um, but the reason I wanted to share it is it's all about due diligence, but it was initiated actually by um, a group of, well, of, of several countries in Africa, wanting to make sure that the due diligence practices of um, Nor northern donors the the um sort of uh you know the U uk usa i think like you referenced the kind of colonial donors um and they really took that active step um to you know to come up with their own system and you know diffid and usa i think cedar have signed up to it um so it's a really interesting thing to share it's a bit it's a little bit off topic but i think it's sort of tied into what you were saying um so I just wanted to share to share that and just really appreciate your input. Thank you so much, Victoria. Uh, the two panelists who will comment on this question um, uh, briefly will be Akmal and Zoe. So Akmal, you first. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, sure, Joyce. So yes, uh, at Piengo, we are trying to create an income generating project for ourselves because we know the future is all about being sustainable. And one of the ways, because Piengo's membership fees doesn't really make it, it's just our national organizations pay a very little membership fee. And um, 
th that is not really substantial and you would not be able to sustain Piango. Therefore, um, uh, our, uh, Piango has embarked on creating a hub where uh, uh, organizations it is anticipated would be able to come and also just like uh, our partners in Cambodia, hire a facility, uh, use a particular space uh, for free thinking, but but technological items and and and, and you know not at a very minimal minimal fees, not really making profit, but to be able to sustain us, but 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 that's yet to be realized. But the other thing is, in terms of humanitarian work, we have been able to receive fundings and and go and work with communities and and come up with. Uh, uh, baseline uh, baseline surveys and reporting and and, and 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 this has been through development assistance but in terms of uh, by uh, in, in a way in a, in a business model that that really at the end of the day benefits our membership on the ground and at the same time it, it brings in some revenue to piango but but the as stated by our colleagues the one thing that Piango does not forget is the co-business it has created. So, because the fear here is that the business arm taking over us and, and that can never happen. So we are very careful of how we are trying to do it. It's of course not set in stone, but we are trying to get, get there. Thank you, Akman. Zoe? Um, just quickly for us, um, and I think uh, Victoria touched on this. A lot of um, our, a lot of our, um, our work in this area is based on our membership. So everything that we, or kind of our unrestricted funding, comes from selling services to our members. And as our members are with, we know from that survey, are going to be going through a difficult time financially. That means we ourselves are going to be going through a different difficult time financially. So while we have to be really careful and look at kind of all the different income that we get from um, from grants, from um, un an unrestricted funding that we create by selling these services, to make sure that we're constantly checking them because at any point one area can drop and another and we just need to keep our eye on the ball all the time so while it sounds really good to be able to to do this uh we, we definitely have been affected by COVID-19 and the economic downturn Victoria Rachel any comments to move to the next question yeah, I think I think we can move to the next question. I mean, I think um, it's it's been really interesting to hear from the others as well about how, while it's an important income stream, it's actually not a major income stream. I suppose um, income from selling services is always unrestricted, which is also always a good thing as well. Yeah. But um, yeah, that's that's all I had to add. Thank you. Um... Our next question, um, and, and Rachel, if you can, when you take the floor, just speak a bit um, uh, louder for stronger for the interpreters. That would be great. Okay. Um, yeah. Then our next question is, our next, I, we can hear you fine, but it seems that the interpreters would like you, you to speak a bit more. And um, so the fifth uh, question is, does your organization have a continuous process of scoping new donors and or of regular consultations with members in order to decide on a few strategic priority targets? So the idea is to know um, the, the the answer are the first one yes we address this subject at least once a year the second is no we look into this subject as the need presents itself and the third one is no we do not have a fundraising strategy the idea for this question is just to understand how often you go over um you have this internal process of uh scoping for new donors or consulting, uh, consulting with your members uh, on uh, strategic priority targets. 
Okay, we have uh, quite a few people vote already. Let me give you 10 seconds more. Uh, first, first answer once a year, second, um, it, it, relatively irregularly when the subject presents itself, and then the third one is, uh, no, we don't have a fundraising strategy. Okay, we can show the results now, I think, and I'll go pass over to Rachel. Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, that's fantastic. We've got 82% of, um, of respondents saying that they address this subject at least once a year. And I think um, everybody's aware of how important having a strategy for fundraising is um, in terms of having a plan, but also regularly reviewing it. So um, it's great to see those results. I think it also does link back to Liliana's point earlier on about really staying true to your value because having a fundraising strategy also allows you to to make sure that your income generation your sustainability is is linked to your 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 reason of being um, so I think that, that that's another another reason why it's really important and making sure that your fundraising strategy is anchored within your overall um, organizational strategy as well. Um, so yes, that's the, that's the, um, the comments that I've got to make on that, but it's, it's really, really promising, promising results there on the poll. Thank you, Rita. Um, we, if I understand correctly, I think Sarun, you are asking for the floor. Let me know if you want to jump in or not at this time. Okay, um, Liliana, did you want to take the floor? Gracias, Joyce y Rachel. Sí, la experiencia que tenemos en la confederación es solo venimos a adaptar eh, desde el año pasado y es que obviamente tenemos un plan estratégico y tenemos un plan de acción que definimos año a año y para desde el año pasado en el plan de acción estamos incorporando eh, el plan de inversiones que necesitamos para cada una de las acciones que desarrollamos en las líneas estratégicas. Esto con el propósito de... Eh, que cada miembro o ya sea otro actor, otro cooperante puedan aportar, pero de acuerdo a las acciones pues que priorizamos y creo que esto nos ha ayudado mucho a esa recaudación de fondos, o sea, porque un socio puede vincularse no solo a través de su cuota de membresía, sino que también hay una línea de acción que él quiere respaldar y que puede apoyar con recursos extras o también nos puede, o también nos sirve para gestionar eh, recursos, eh, pero a través de esas prioridades que establecemos. Si hay una prioridad nueva que no está ya establecida, eh, aquí yo creo que hay una diferenciación muy importante en cómo la confederación gestiona recursos, y es que nosotros no, no participamos en convocatorias públicas o de la cooperación internacional, si no está encaminada esa, esa convocatoria a, a aportar a las líneas de acción que tenemos. Entonces, esto también nos permite a nosotros siempre mantener el foco de, que, de nuestra oferta de valor, de potenciarla y de, y de estarla innovando. Yo creo que es una experiencia pues, que va y obviamente este año tuvimos un bache con la crisis provocada por la pandemia, pero creo que poder relacionar los presupuestos de las organizaciones, no solo con temas administrativos, sino con un plan de inversiones a sus acciones, es realmente llamativo y genera también como eh, una convocatoria especial a los donantes. Muchas gracias, Liliana. Uh, now let me give the floor uh, to Mr. Uh, Monamatsi Sokoe. Can you... Can you take the floor? Let's eh? try. Yes, we can hear you. 
good evening. Good evening. Over to you. Yep. Um, my, my, I'm looking at some of the questions and how uh, we, we are responding. And as in relation to, to fund, funding of civil society, um, um, uh, we, we, we are seeing a lot in the civil society where now uh, organizations seem to be fund to be the scoping as, as, as the question is currently is scoping for donors. Uh, you know, however, we don't see a lot uh, nowadays, uh, and it, it happens across most uh, parts of the world where civil society now is looking more for funding uh, as opposed to solutions for communities for which they serve. And in most cases, even if you look at civil society transparency, you it is equated to how well they are able to account for finances, among others, to their donors, uh, as opposed uh, to being held uh, responsible for the, the 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 objectives uh which is uh, to serve uh to serve uh, the the communities uh the solutions of our our of 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 our, of our civil society nowadays are based as, as this question once again on on scoping the new donors and, and trying to align and as uh, the previous uh, the other speaker earlier George, said, you hear me Joyce? Hello. Yes. I, I don't hear all of you, but if you hear me, that's good. You hear me, right? Yes. I, I, can, I can hear you. We can, we can, we'll give you. Okay. You. Um, if you hear me, I can share you a little bit on the, in terms of fundraisings. I think most of the specialist uh, uh, panelists focusing on money raisings, but uh, to me, I already support with this the funding strategies uh, to, to raise funds from. Uh, institutional donors or individual, but uh, what I have experienced is about uh, having uh, voluntarism. For us, CCC, we have around 170 volunteers. They are expertise, so they can also contribute as a pro bono services or even the expertise to support our members or also non-members who need particular services. For example, the expertise on human resource development, on financial management, ICDs or uh, governance and this and that, so that they also can provide this types of uh, services to other members. So we try to best use of the uh, volunteerism as well as we also mobilize in kind support uh, beyond uh, uh, money. So uh, that's what uh, I would like to say. Thank you. I hope you hear me. Thank you. But I don't hear anything from others. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you to Sarun. And my apologies uh, for Mr. Monametsky. So no, it's fine. Interrupted. He wasn't hearing you, so that's why I couldn't tell him that he was he interrupted you. you. Know, I, I totally understand. Uh, like I, said, uh, uh, I, I, our, our strategies, my, 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 the challenge that we are seeing, our strategies are not really based a lot nowadays in in uh, community solutions. Uh, it will be interesting to see how many of us. Are, are saying we have innovative solutions we have community you know strategies that can take out uh people communities out of poverty that can fight gbv and uh, we don't see a lot of funding in those strategies of, of those strategies but uh, all in all what i'm saying is i see a lot of that way emphasis is put on aligning to our donors and, and even not even being held accountable for the results in communities. Uh, I'm not uh, even here at, at my organization in, 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 in Bukongo. Uh, that is uh, something that we are, we are struggling with because of course, uh, for coordinating organizations nowadays, funding is, 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 is the big challenge uh, as opposed to service delivery organizations. And uh, we are looking towards uh, how do we now provide real solutions, and that is how our strategy is going to be based. How do we provide uh, investable solutions now to our communities? Uh, also, introspecting and looking at the fact that for the longest of times, 
we have been focusing on, on, on finding a donor as opposed to finding real solutions uh, for communities. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Rachel, Victoria? Yeah, I think, um, thank you very much, Mama Metsu. That That's a, a really um, interesting point. And, and I think um, that the, these challenging times, these difficult times that we're faced with, that they really do require a completely different way of, of looking at things. And rather than trying to find donors all the time that's, that are fitting what we want to do, to actually be thinking of it in terms of how do we innovate to meet the needs of the communities. I think that that's a very valuable contribution. And thanks um, Lily, um, also to Sarun who, uh, for introducing um, the topic of the, you know, volunteering and human resources being an equally important part of the, the resource mix that organizations need. Thank you. Um, uh, Victoria, would you want to jump in to tell us about uh, keeping in touch uh, with donors outside of uh, application and reporting windows? Yeah, sure. I think that's a really important part of the funding strategy is um, it's not just your applications and your research, it's it's just that relationship building. Um, and and it was something, a big sort of recommendation of the report. And one of the items that I think is even more important during um, COVID-19, um, it really keeps us at the front of the donors' minds if they, if they, need, um, if they need someone to implement something. Um, one example that's often quoted is, as you reach the end of the financial year, if they have some underspend um, that they're looking to get it spent on time, then someone who's been in touch with them, telling them the work they're doing, perhaps reporting on your current funding, um, maybe sharing ideas of the extra things you'd like to do, then they can really then think, oh, maybe, maybe that's the answer to my problem of wanting to get this money spent down. Um, we can just reach out to say hello. I think it's not only ourselves who might be working at home at the moment, um, our donors are as well. And, and sometimes it's just, yeah, great to speak to someone different at the end of Zoom than, than that, the usual people. Um, and, and just to see how things are going and share things that are working well for you, perhaps in relation to sort of working remotely as well as about your members. Um, some people ask me, well, how, you know, what should I say if I'm not used to talking to my donors in between reporting? Um, and I think just sending an email is, is often an easy way to open the door and maybe suggest a call to catch up. Um, you might have a new resource um, or a case study, some learning to share, um, something that's come out of your member survey that you think the donor would be interested in. So that can be something to share um, for Forest, you know, to give a live example, they might share this toolkit um, and, and, and that might be and you might wonder what the donor thinks about the recommendations or if they'd add anything um, maybe they'd find it useful to share with others and then having a call um, just to follow up it's not you won't necessarily get anything out of that call but it's just building that relationship for the future if you do run into problems implementing it can really help you that you've got that relationship um, but on a more positive side you can be the first to know about the new funding streams they're developing. You can start to get ready for those calls. Um, you can sometimes influence the design of their new funding stream. Um, and, and as I say, if they do suddenly have money they need to spend, you might be the first, the first to hear about it. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Victoria. Um, we're going to move now to our um, final question uh, and then uh, already go to some, um, to some uh, conclusion remarks. Let's put the final question on the screen, please. Which is about private donors. Um, so the question is, let me read that for you. Uh, what is your current relationship 
with private donors. The first uh, two uh, answers are linked to not having a relationship with private donors. So the first one is, we do not have any, and it's not a priority for our network. The second one is, we currently do not have any relationship with private donors, but we are planning to reach out to a few of them. The third answer is at least 20% of our income comes from private donors. And the fourth is more than 20% of our income comes from private donors. So let me do that again, since I see people are still voting. Uh, the question is about a current relationship with private donors. First answer, no relationship and not a priority. Second answer, no relationship, but planning to reach out to them. Third answer, 20% or more of our income comes from private donor. Fourth, fourth is more than 20 of our, our income. Okay, we received a few extra votes. Let's show them on the screen, please. And then I'll give the floor directly to Rachel. Okay, thank you, Joyce. So, um, yeah, so that, again, interesting poll results there. 50% um, of uh, those that have responded have said that they're planning to reach out to them, um, that they don't have them at the moment. And then um, we've got uh, just 21% who are currently getting income from private donors. Um, nobody is saying that more than 20% of their income comes from this source. So I think that that is a really good reflection of the current climate. Uh, certainly in the UK, I think these sources are seen as, um, as a more stable source of income in the current economic climate, at least for the time being. And um, certainly um, is a direction that, that uh, lots of organizations are looking to, but it would be good to hear from um, the other panelists uh, experience of this as well. Yes, uh, so the floor goes directly to Liliana. Gracias, Joyce. Aquí un poco la experiencia de la Confederación Colombiana de ONGs en torno a esta forma de relacionarnos con el sector empresarial empezó o bueno, surge porque en Colombia hay un número importante de fundaciones de empresas que eh, contrataban o subcontrataban organizaciones sociales para ejecutar como sus, sus estrategias de responsabilidad social y en otros aspectos también contrataban empresas o consultorías para fortalecer organizaciones. Vimos que allí había como una oportunidad eh, de eh, llegar a ese sector empresarial, a, a este sector fundacional a partir de la oferta de valor con una premisa y es que eh, las iniciativas eh, de fortalecimiento de capacidades de las organizaciones sociales de base en territorio y demás deberían ser acompañadas por pares más que por consultorías con una mirada empresarial. Entonces a, hemos empezado a conversar, a generar primero pues como esa confianza que es necesaria. Yo creo que siempre prima eh, la desconfianza entre el sector empresarial y el social, pero mm, creo que es, nos ha resultado muy importante primero Entender ellos cómo trabajan con las comunidades y segundo, tratar de encontrar algo que sea común, eh, que desde luego eh, genere unas transacciones gana-gana. O sea, no puede ser una transacción donde eh, no se valore el aporte eh, de, la, de las organizaciones que acompañan estos procesos. Entonces, allí ha surgido como una forma de relacionarnos y de articularnos con ellos. Eh, pero muy, muy, pues, desde que no sean cosas impuestas eh, o que nos exijan hacer ciertas cosas, sino de construcción colectiva entre lo que uno hace y que se valore la acción que uno como organización hace frente a esas demandas de fortalecimiento a grupos poblacionales o organizaciones en territorio. Entonces, creo que es una experiencia que va dejando algunos saldos 
pedagógicos interesantes de cómo relacionarnos y trabajar con, con el sector empresarial. Lo fundamental es eso, que se valore el saber hacer de las organizaciones, que no solo son recursos económicos lo que priman en una relación o en una articulación. Gracias. Gracias, Liliana. Um, we can still give the floor very briefly to one panelist. I think so. Let me move it to the panel. Um, Sarun, you had your hand up. Do you want to take the floor? I know you got disconnected and now you're back. So I don't know if that was that. Yes. You hear me, right? Yes. So did you want to comment on the private donors? Uh all right the, the thing the thing the experience we have here is is to, to reflect our role as a member-based organizations for us like we have uh, 200 organizations directly here but also about 5,000 community-based organizations so we understand what are the key uh, priorities especially those who work as a community they can transform some of their activity to social business or social enterprise or, or many other activities. So CCC play a very important role to have the, uh, I mean, platform between uh, private sectors and, and our member as well as uh, community-based organization so that they can have better understanding and sometimes they can have business match. So then the, the initiative at the community level also become fully funded with the private sector. Even they also can have the investment money to uh, uh, support themselves. So uh, we not uh, we also, I mean, not get money directly to CCC, but also they, we are trying to support our members and non-members to get money or investment from from the private sectors. But we also teach our members or, or non-members to understand how they can conduct due diligence uh, with the uh, uh, private sectors, especially to understand the business and human rights guiding principle of the UN. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarun. Um, I'm wondering if uh, Mr. Munametsky Sokowe would like to take the floor because I saw you had um, your hand up. So just can you just let me know if you want to take the floor now or not? Uh, I'm okay for now. I think I think uh, he said what I wanted to do. Thank you so much. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, we will hear again from our panelists uh, at the end in the concluding remarks. Um, but I am I'm aware of the time. I see we're reaching the first the final half hour of our uh, session. Uh, so I just did wanted to give uh, Victoria and Rachel the opportunity to um, a final overview and perhaps uh, to tell us what were the standout findings uh, for each one of you, whatever you thought was more, most important, more surprising, um, what can change uh, uh, and what can be even a bigger challenge in times of COVID. So I'll give you a couple of, of minutes uh, each for these uh, final remarks. And then we'll uh, give the floor to the panelists. Thank you, Joyce. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think one of the surprising things for me at the time of the research was that point about the, the high reliance on a single donor. Um, I wasn't, yeah, I don't think I was expecting that. So that was the kind of surprise for me. Um, and then my big standout, I think, is that idea of keeping in touch with donors. I, I think I've said a lot about that already, so I won't say too much more. But I think that's the big thing which stands out as being important um at this time to be and, and I think a combined thing is that idea of really knowing what our value is um we have to know that to be in touch with our donors um I think it's a time when that when relationships 
are even more at the core of our fundraising um, and they're, they're things to be developing. Um, I'd really recommend people to do that. I was listening to a podcast the other day, actually, which was all about keeping in touch. Um, and it suggested having, you know, a list of five to 10 people um, and just planning out a, a moment to connect with them in the in the coming week or two. So I'd really encourage people who are listening who think, oh, I, I could do that. That's a good idea. I just really encourage you to make a note, uh, even right at the end of this call, maybe just dot, jot down three names perhaps put them straight into your calendar for, for later this week um, and just take take that first step and, and see see how hopefully how much you enjoy it, but also perhaps what it leads to. Um, that would be, yeah, my kind of my final final word. Well, maybe not my final word, but my final word for now. Thank you. Yes, thanks, uh, Victoria and, and Joyce as well. Um, so yeah, from my point of view, I think that the the thing that really stood out to me from the research was um, finding out about finding out about new and innovative approaches to to um, funding uh, like community grant making, community foundations, um, those kinds of approaches that are actually around shifting the power, and and I think it connects well to some of the 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 contributions from the panelists around staying true to the you know, true to the, the mandate from the membership, which uh, which connects back again to to Victoria's point just now about really knowing and understanding your value. Um, but yes, and, and I suppose the other point that I wanted to raise was around influencing donors. That it's um, that now more than ever is the right time to be influencing donor practice wherever we can. Um, I think COVID has really demonstrated how donors can come together to be flexible, um, to react quickly, um, to, to partner well with the organisations that they are supporting. And it will be a great opportunity for us to pull out that good practice and reflect it back to the donors. Thank you so much, uh, Victoria and Rachel. Um, I'm going to now give the floor to um, our panelists for closing remarks. Um, Sarun, do you mind uh, if we start with you? You have uh, four minutes, very brief uh, closing remarks. All right, I, I continue to stay on my point is about raising funds, uh, raising uh, friends where um, it's not just only money, but also building relationship with individuals in the, the institutional donors, as well as our members who already have a lot of capacities and human resources that they can share their uh, best practices among others. But also at the same time, uh, I also support our previous speakers as a closing uh, remark is that, how we can also work together to influence the donors. Like the case in Cambodia here, we try to push the uh, donors, including uh, EU, to have the, uh, the CSO facilities as a pool of resources, but uh, not yet success. And we are continue to push for, for, for this purpose because we understand that the more resources can be in the hands of community-based organizations or local NGOs, the more flexibilities as well as the resilience of that organization to address the, the, the challenges or the, uh, any particular issues faced by their communities. And last but not least, I, I, I think uh, we need to diversify funding, not just only within the uh, existing donors, but also how we can bring in other stakeholders, including private sectors, where we can connect with the communities as well as the private sector, they can also join investment so that they can achieve their mission and visions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um Liliana, over to you. You have uh, the same four minutes for your closing remarks. Gracias. Bueno, tengo 
cuatro cosas que decir. La primera es que eh, yo creo que tenemos en el contexto y sobre todo por la realidad de mi país, Colombia, eh, un contexto eh, difícil frente al tema de financiación para las organizaciones de la sociedad civil y allí hay unos, eh, unas alertas que quiero compartir con ustedes porque es importante que como colectivo podamos tenerlas presentes y adelantar acciones en torno a ellas. Primero son los bonos de impacto social que no sé si los han escuchado eh, son recursos que destina el sector empresarial para desarrollar o llevar a cabo la implementación de políticas públicas. Ellos ponen todo el recurso inicialmente y luego le piden a los gobiernos que se lo devuelvan. Esto nos deja por fuera de todas las posibilidades de poder acceder a recursos públicos. Y la, la otra alerta es un tema que tiene que ver con el rol de algunos cooperantes frente a la administración y ejecución de recursos públicos, también lo cual nos deja por fuera de poder acceder a estos recursos. Eh, ahí yo creo que allí es pertinente poner una lupa y ver qué acciones se pueden hacer porque no solo se viene presentando en Colombia, sino también en otros países de la región estas realidades. Lo otro que quiero mencionar es... Eh, la importancia de que como plataformas agreguemos valor a la acción eh, que desarrollamos y que obviamente nos diferencia eh, de la acción que hacen nuestros miembros. Y aquí nosotros eh, estamos trabajando para que en realidad se valore ese rol político, ese rol de vocería, ese rol de incidencia que tenemos las plataformas y ver la posibilidad de empezar a construir fondos comunes propios para las organizaciones de la sociedad civil, obvio con inversiones de diferentes fuentes, pero es, son fondos que permitan desarrollar la oferta de valor propia que, que adelantamos. Otro tema eh, que quiero mencionar tiene que ver con el, con el poder de la producción de información que tenemos nosotras las plataformas de organizaciones de la sociedad civil, digamos que vía, por ejemplo, iniciativas como Transparencia de Rendición de Cuentas, nuestra participación en ODS, podemos generar valor e información de lo que hacen nuestros miembros y esto sin lugar a dudas facilita la articulación entre las mismas organizaciones evitando duplicidades pero también facilita mucho ese relacionamiento con los diferentes actores, yo creo que alguien lo mencionaba y es muy importante poder como plataformas participar en esas estrategias país o estrategias regionales que establecen los donantes, yo creo que hay un mecanismo que tenemos que seguir mirando cómo fortalecemos nuestra participación en él y es por ejemplo el de la hoja de ruta de la Unión Europea, hay otros donantes que quizás tienen estos mecanismos, tenemos que identificarlos y también fortalecer nuestro diálogo para que los temas que trabajamos puedan quedar allí eh, inmersos y termino diciendo que es importante seguir construyendo esa confianza eh, para poder establecer esas relaciones en igualdad de condiciones como pares o como, como aliados, nunca subsumidos ni sometidos con el sector empresarial. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Liliana. Um, Akmal, uh, over to you for your final remarks. You also have four minutes. Who is this, Joyce? Sorry. Okay, we can hear you now. Can you hear us? Are, are you talking to me? This is Akmal. Yes, it's, um, I, I gave you the floor for your final remarks. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I couldn't hear that. Uh, so, so sorry. I actually truly agree with Liliana what she has said. Donors need to look at us as partners because development can only take place with a multi-stakeholder uh, approach, as the report suggests. And, and so does SDG 17.17 says, that sustainable development goals can only become a reality if there's a genuine partnership between civil society, private sector, government, and the UN mechanisms. And of course, we have the Busan Partnership Agreement where the governments have recognized us as equal partners in development. But then again, do they walk their talk? That's another thing. 
However, as civil society, I think the very important thing that we must always perceive is not charity, but dignity. That is the key. And in terms of create, in terms of sustaining your current relationship with our donors and partners, I think in the Pacific, as we say, it's all about relationality. It's how you keep your relationships with your donors. Because at the end of the day, the person sitting behind the desk is also a human being. The relationship that you keep. In the Pacific, we approach things in the way we do in the Pacific. So we have had some very good relationships. One of our partners, which is Bread for the World, which is a German-based organization, is an amazing organization that truly does not dictate its funding through its criteria of trying to achieve what they so bread for the world does not dictate of how uh, dictate really of how they want their funds to be used like other donors just recently in fiji there has been a case where uh, a group of people came up with an initiative which is which was called Bata for Better Fiji, which is using traditional mechanism of not using money, but to exchange goods and services without using money. So uh, you could do a particular job for somebody and they could get you groceries and all that. And, and suddenly on Facebook, because Fiji just has a population of about a million, this group has 191,000 people in it. And, and one of the UN agencies tried to give them funding. But, and, 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 and when they tried to give them funding, they tried to dictate to them what to do. And the organizers or the committee that made this little initiative, and this was, this was during COVID, that this initiative came up because there was hardships in the community. Um, they decided to refuse funding from these donors on the point that they could not compromise on their values and they could not be dictated on uh, to doing things that they were not comfortable doing. So there are donors like Bread for the World who are very kind and who are very generous and who, re who, who maintain an amazing relationships. But then there are other donors who try to tell you or dictate to you to achieve their own means and goals. So I think at that stage, we must be careful. And also the competition of trying to just get funding. It is an unethical behavior, even in our civil society sector. We as civil society must have the solidarity. If one organization says no, we must find out why. Is it because on ethical reasons? These are the tough questions and decisions that we we have we do not really uh, the, in the sector people do not ask, but we must ask these questions. We on that note, I, I do not mean to offend anybody, but 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 these are the things we must consider. What really is ethics? What really is civil society solidarity? Our spaces only become further shrink when we don't have solidarity amongst ourselves. And, and most of the time, it is because uh, an international organization tries to come in and take over the role of a local organization, or, uh, or which is already which already has enough capacity, which is fund ready, and, and and tries to come and duplicate the work of a local organization, whereas the local should be doing the job, and and locals are never ready because international organizations always take over the space. So these are the things I think we could always unpack in another forum, but, uh, but, but this is a great toolkit and, and, and I love it. And I love it. I've, I've actually read every word of it. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ekman. Uh, our last panelist who is uh, giving us um, closing remarks is Monametsky Sokoli. Over to you. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, thank you much uh, to Forrest and to the rest of the, the, the team that's, that's, that's here. I just wanted to also go back to just uh, appreciate the toolkit. I think it's, 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 it's very interesting and we would like to, to take it up and also to take up on the challenge. I think it will take us, uh, Forrest with us as uh, one that you go back to as, as for a start. Yeah. 
Um, in terms of our, our challenges that we know, uh, Botswana faces a peculiar challenge of being an upper middle income country. As we all are aware, economies can be uh, upper middle income countries. However, it does not necessarily translate into communities being upper middle income too. So the challenge that you face is that when it comes to issues of funding, you are left out as a country because you are perceived to be uh, an upper middle income country. However, in the process, uh, the, 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 the funding community forgets that uh, they are not necessarily funding the, 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 the bureaucracy, rather they, they are funding communities and it will be interesting for them uh, to do community assessments to see if poverty levels, if uh, diseases, if all these other social ills, uh, GBV, for example, uh, rates are very high, but it does, does it, that cannot be reflected in the numbers or economic uh, indexes. Uh, you know, issues of GBV, the social is, they just take the economic uh, indexes. And I also want to say that uh, it's, it's high time also uh, as civil society to use our currency, which uh, is the community. We need to start working more on the community-led solutions, uh, balancing the needs of our donors and staying very focused as our previous speaker saying to our values of community development and and you know being persevering because we are also the guardians of the morals of our communities and the values of our societies i also want to urge our members to also look at you know creating indigenous intellectual properties uh to 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 help communities work with uh, the indigenous knowledges and, I didn't, and, and realizing that the private sectors that we go to actually benefit from using the resources within our communities to make the profits that we go back and, and, and ask for, for, for monies for while we were there and not realizing that while we are chasing donors, we left it the real treasure, which is the knowledge that we can harness from our societies and turn it into a currency. Uh, the last thing, of course, I will talk to innovation. How do we innovate? Uh, are we providing solutions in terms of using technology, in terms of new ideas, in terms of new community-led solutions, and, and also creating our constitutions as I go back again. It's very important as civil society to always be staying true to our constitutions. And I do believe that uh, as we engage uh, and as far as go to this meeting in France and other countries, they will take uh, some of these uh, discussion, you know, questions and some of the, 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 the comments from our, our, our colleagues here into consideration. I want to thank you once again and good evening. So much. Uh, I thank you so much to, to all the panelists for this uh, very inspiring closing remarks. I think we have uh, enough material ready for the next conversation we're going to have about this. Um, I'm going to give the floor briefly to Sarah Hannon from the Forest team. She's the development manager of Forest. Um, she will also tell us, say a few words in conclusion. Hey, Sarah. Hi, thank you very much, Joyce, and thanks very much to everybody. It's been such a great conversation. I love how we went really concrete, but at the same time, um, I really wanted to echo one message that has come out of several people's interventions, which is all of the ways that we are full of resources and, and really rich as civil society. And, and I love, uh, you know, the, the reminder of the links to communities, of the intellectual property, um, of all of these resources that we do have. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're looking to find a way to, to monetize that in a way and to also have access to these financial resources. Um, and I feel that this really difficult fundraising time, because it is difficult, it is hugely challenging, I think, and I, you know, we watch the trends of ODA, we watch the, the, the high expectations from all sorts of donors, uh, the complexity of the requirements that despite years of advocacy don't necessarily get that much easier. Um, and, and I think that context is really challenging us to come together more. And I think this big trap of competition with each other um, is one that we really need to look at how to how to start past. Um, so really, you know, what I'd like to say is more of an offer um, for us to come together, I think, to connect our fundraising 
strategies uh, definitely is a really interesting conversation that would be good to have. Um, around the time of next year, I saw that our colleague Z Leah from ZCSD uh, in the Zambia is asking, you know, what for support to create our fundraising strategies? And I think, you know, we're always interested in those conversations and we're especially interested in seeing where the links are with our own, with each other's strategies. Where are these opportunities for joint fundraising? Um, I think, you know, we see some really large donors, uh, you know, still going for very large, you know, pots of funding that require consortia that want to see new forms of partnership and uh, for fours that are used to working as a network, we're really well positioned for that. Um, and I know I've been in contact with many of you around, you know, specific opportunities and specific calls. And, you know, we are also here to come on on board um, and to, to create those links and collaborations for opportunities that you would like to go for um, and would also like to collaborate on. Um, and then also, I really want to echo what have been said about, you know, different quality of donors, right, and donors that are setting the agenda in one way or the other. Um, and that's something that we've recently researched in more depth, especially with regards to uh, European Union work in, in Africa, and how the financial package often comes with uh, a structuring of civil society, agenda setting for civil society, um, that, you know, often we can feel is very much an imposition. Um, and so I think here we also have an opportunity to yield more power in coming together and to work better together in influencing uh, donors. I think as force, we can definitely commit to bringing together more voices and connections in our meetings with donors, in our discussions that we have, whether with the EU, whether with the French Development Agency. Uh, you know, we do want to have those discussions with a multitude of voices. It's not just about having a relationship with a four secretariat, but it's also about, you know, can we connect to each other? Can we create these new relationships um, and support each other to open new doors. And I think that will not just mean, you know, a better understanding from our part of our collective power, um, but also more influence on donors uh, in terms of uh, their own priorities, their funding modalities, their flexibility, and also their levels of, of trust um, in how we work together. Um, so, just to conclude, um, I'll, I'll be delighted to continue these conversations and thanks again for such great contributions. Thanks so much, Sarah, um, for the invitation um, of working with, with Forrest on these subjects. Uh, we do, um, we are arriving at the very end of our session uh, and we also wanted to take a second to encourage you to um, work through that uh, that toolkit um, with your with your constituency with your members. Um, perhaps uh, going over that uh, a chapter a week with your members with your governance bodies. Uh, you have. Uh, a lot of um, amazing reflection questions that Rachel and Victoria proposed to us based on the work that uh, Forest members are undertaking. Uh, it would be great to, if you do decide to use the tool, to t use it with your constituency to get back to us, to tell us how does that work, uh, what worked best for you. We're keen to, to receive feedback on that. Um, and I think that I am then now moving to a, a huge thank you. Uh, so firstly for um, Flamingo for NGOs, um, uh, represented here by Rachel and Victoria. Thanks so much for uh, agreeing to join uh, the session, for thinking it through uh, with us. It was a pleasure uh, connecting with you both again. Um, then I really wanted to ask again, uh, to thanks again, uh, our panelists uh, for all your amazing contributions as always. Um, thank, thanks also to all the interpreters who made uh, this conversation possible in three languages. So thanks to Roberto Sanchez in Mexico City, uh, Maribel Egremi in Istanbul, Turkey, Adriana Buturera in Montevideo, Uruguay, and Olivia Ocana in Vancouver, Canada. Thanks so much to, to the hard work uh, uh, for the interpreters. Um, again, thanks to all of the colleagues uh, 
uh, in force uh, for making all of this, uh, not only this session, but all of them happen uh, this week. Um, I think this is the last session in the open part of the forum. We will continue uh, tomorrow and the day after with sessions for members. Um, in, in thanking for his colleagues, I did, just did wanted to create space to thank uh, Ivana Jimenez, who is uh, the intern for in capacity development and membership. She, that uh, was really important for uh, her support for all of the sessions to happen. And you already have a final survey on the screen because um, that's how efficient colleagues are. Um, the question is, on a scale of one to four, how useful was this meeting for you? And then we ask you, very, the most useful is four, and then three useful, two neutral, one not useful. Uh, we're happy to hear your feedback and to to adapt into next conversations and to continue these exchanges with you. Um, we'll give you a moment to, to vote, but in the meanwhile, thanks again, Rachel and Victoria. Thanks. Um, thanks, Liliana. Thanks, Arun. Thanks, Akmal. And thanks, uh, Monamitsi. Very kind of you to join us. Thank you very much, Joyce. Thank you. Thank you for Thank saying. Thank you, Joyce. For saying so long, especially Akmal. <laughs> That's so late. It's, it's 4 30 a.m. in the morning. I'm going oh, to sleep boy. now. <laughs> ah, it's just too early. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a lovely all night of sleep or afternoon or night. Bye-bye. Great. Thanks, Joyce. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Joyce. Yes. So question. So tomorrow session, the will there be new registrations coming for like uh, forest members or sorry, I didn't catch your question. Can you repeat? So for tomorrow's uh, closed session for members, will like new links be coming to the members? Uh, yes, new links will we're going to be sent by Sarah Streck, who is the director. She will do the same um, as we've been doing every day. So it's a summary with the what we discussed today and then the links for tomorrow. But it's just okay. that on, on Tuesday and Wednesday is really only for Forest members. Up until now, the three first days, they were um, open for everyone. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. It has been great. And you Thanks. all have been amazing. Bye -bye. Thanks to you, Akma, for your contributions. Bye-bye.